Today, we will be designing a TKL keyboard PCB using the RP2040 and hot top sockets. Here I have a KLE, a keyboard layout editor.com. And I have the layout that we want, the TKL, as well as some alternate layouts where it steps caps lock, split left shift, split right shift, ISO enter, uh, split backspace, and sun gun layout, uh, sun gun bottom row. We'll be using KiCad 7, and we will be using the Marbas Lib library for footprints and schematic symbols and a KiCad KLE placer plugin. Let's open KiCad 7 and load in these libraries. In the plugin and content manager in KiCad 7, you go to manage your plugin and content, and we'll go to the add button. And we'll find this URL here in the Marbas lib library in the how to install section, and paste it here. We'll also add the uh, the Zykra KiCad KLE placer URL. We'll copy that and paste it here. This will add the eBastler KiCad repository and the Zykra's KiCad repository to our repositories and we'll hit save. Then we can select the eBastler repository, go to li uh, libraries and install the Marbast lib library. And we'll go to the Zykra's KiCad repository go to the plugins and install the KiCad KLE Placer plugin. And then we can apply pending changes to install them. And close. Make a new project. We'll call it TKL. And we'll do this with the video, so we'll do it for the video. And we'll open the schematic. We're going to base this whole thing around the RP2040. We'll use the A key to add and add the RP2040. We'll also be using a USB-C connector. And RP2040 runs at USB 2.0. And we're going to do a USB-C receptacle. USB-C receptacle 2.0. We need a voltage regulator. I suggest using the XC6206. These are all from the KiCad default libraries so far. We'll also be using the SRV05-4, which is in the Marbast lib library. This is a power protection and ESD protection diode circuit. This is also in the uh, is in the PCM Marbast library. The uh, plugin and Content Manager Marbast lib library. It's also in the KiCad default, but it has less spacing in the middle. So if we do this routable version, um, we can have enough space in the middle to route our USB lines through the middle of it. And I'm also going to be adding a USB daughter board. So I'm going to add a generic connector, a uh, four pin connector for the USB daughter board. The RP2040 also needs a flash chip. I suggest using the W25Q and the 128 megabit variant. Also need a crystal, a 12 megahertz crystal for the X in and X out of the RP2040. So let's grab a crystal. And for the part we're going to be using, a ground on pins two and four is what we're looking for. There are also two switches we need to install. Uh, a reset switch for the RB2040 and a boot select switch for the flash. So if we find a push button switch, uh, SW push, that'll be exactly what we're looking for there. So there's a reset switch and you can copy and paste that for the flash as well. The rest of the circuitry is passives and in the keyboard matrix, and we'll get to those very soon. Now, because this is a TKL and there's going to be quite a lot of parts, I'm going to go ahead and increase the page size to A3. That was file, page settings, size. 
I'm going to move the RP2040 down just a bit and the flash chip uh, below that. This will give us plenty of room to work with with the crystal and with these reset switches. Let's start with the USB and power circuitry. So um, the V bus is five volts coming from the computer, and this is also true on pin one of the unified auto board connector. So let's add a power symbol from the right hand side here and add V bus. You can hit, uh, just click the red circles on the end of these components or hit the W key to start adding a wire anywhere. I'm just going to click, 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 right? Connect the dots. On the JST connector, this is already filtered, so we're just going to go ahead and put a 5 volt power line there. To filter our VBUS down to a stable 5 volts, we're going to use a fuse. So we'll grab a fuse, fuse small just because it takes up less space on the schematic. We'll wire that in from the VBUS input and connect 5 volts to the output. So this is a 5 volts driven through um, the fuse from the USB port. This 5 volts will also be the input to our 3.3 volt voltage regulator. Then the output of that voltage regulator will be, of course, our 3.3 volt. I'm going to use 3V3 for this schematic. We need to add grounds to all of these parts. In our power pin selection, we can add a ground. And copy and paste that ground around. You can use G to move components while keeping them connected. So right now, this ground symbol is sent to the ground pin to the USB-C port. If I use M to move it, it moves it away. But if I use G, I can move it and it stays connected with a green wire. There's a lot of debate about this, but I find it simplest and applicable to use to just connect shield directly to ground for keyboard PCBs. For the ESD chip here, V negative is obviously going to be ground and V positive. There is some debate as well, but I like to connect that to V bus before the fuse if I was doing a USB-C port only, but if I'm using a daughter board, then you need to connect it to five volts directly. And so since we're using both on this design, we'll be connecting it to the five volt rail. So in both cases, um, the ESD chip on the PCB will be going through the fuse to go to the, uh, to the, go to, um, the power from the computer. There is usually an ESD chip built into most daughter boards. We will not be using the SBU connectors, so we can mark those with no connection X's. That's along the right side here. A CC1 and CC2 pins each need their own 3.3 or a 5.1K resistor, sorry, to ground. So let's add an R small. Edit that so the value is 5.1K. And we'll connect those to the CC pins. And the other end of these resistors goes directly to ground. We'll add a global label on the right hand side here is the A with the um, five sided shape around it for D plus and D minus. And control V, control or control C, control V to copy paste, and then E to edit before placing it, and then click to place. On the USB C port, we'll short the D minus pins together. Those two pins are there so that the connector can be reversed, and you still 
can use the USB-C port in either orientation. On the JST connector, D- is on top. Control C, Control V to move these labels. And I'm going to put uh, D plus on pin one here and D minus on pin six, and this will make it easy to route right through the middle of this ESD chip. The 3.3 volt regulator also needs uh, one microfarad decoupling capacitors or stabilizing capacitors um, on the inputs and outputs. So let's add a C small. We'll change that to be a one microfarad, one U. And we can put one on the input and the output and wire the other end of those to ground. We will not be using IO2 or IO3 of the SRV04 at this time, V05-4. Um, we can add the no connection tags to those. The no connection tags are optional, but it it is a cleaner way to route your, your schematic. Now to the RP2040. We need to connect the power pins and some of the other larger uh, or more important connections here. So the VREG in, uh, I of uh, VDD, and then the USB VDD and ADC VDD all connect together. And then the VREG out and DVDD connect together as well. The power pin grouping on the right is 3.3 volts. And on the left is 1.1 volts. And there's an internal voltage regulator within the RP2040 that creates that 1.1 volt rail. We need to add decoupling capacitors to each of these pins. And at least one, one U capacitor, uh, one for the VREG out and one for the VREG in, just like we had for this VREG. And then the rest of the pins need uh, 100 nanofarad decoupling capacitors. And I also want a 10 microfarad bulk capacitor for the power input to our 3.3 volt circuit. So let's add some more C-smalls. We're going to have the 10 microfarad bulk, the one microfarad regulator capacitors, and the 100 nanofarad decoupling capacitors. For the 1.1 volt rail, we need one of these and one of these. That's done. And with the 3.3 volt rail, we have our bulk, we have our VREG, and we have three more pins for 100 nanofarad. We'll connect those in parallel amongst themselves. Here's our 1.1 volt, and here's our 3.3 volt. copy and paste in these labels, and then connecting the other side of the capacitors to ground. This run pin is basically going to be our reset pin. So every time this pin is pressed, the controller will go into reset. This reset pin will be wired to one of these switches. And will be pulled up to 3.3 volts through a 5.1K resistor. The other end of the switch will go to ground. So when the switch is pressed, the reset line is pulled low. USB D plus and D minus, uh, pretty self explanatory. You grab your D plus and D minus. But there's one catch we need to add terminating resistors to these pins. In the case of the RP2040, that is a 27 ohm resistor. So let's add R small. Set that to be 27 ohms. And add one to each line. For the D plus and D minus. Wonderful. The test enable will be tied directly to ground. 
this is a pin that is pulled high when you want to test the RP2040 like in the factory and we are not in the factory anymore. Um, the RP2040 has been produced and has been sold to us already. So that's for the people who are making these RP2040 chips, not for us. SW clock and SW data pins will be breaking those out to a header. So we'll make global labels for those as well. And let's go ahead and add that header. So I'm going to make a, uh, a standard or a kind of generic 5-pin header, 01 by 05. I'm going to wire a few, a few things to this uh, header here. Let's put it up here. We're going to wire our clock and data for the SWD. Also going to wire our reset pin. And then also some power references. So let's get 3.3 volts and ground. Now there are a few different standards for the ordering of this kind of header, um, but I find that you rarely need it and when you do, um, you just go back to the schematic, see what you did, and it's such a one-off case that you actually need to use this connector that it's okay if things aren't as standard as, um, <laughs> as they can be. As long as you know what you've designed and you can reference your own documentation, then the order of these pins uh, is not super critical. The last two parts are the QSPY and the crystal. So the crystal here um, is a four pad crystal with grounds on two and four. And then the pin one will be going to our X out and that will go through a 1K resistor. So let's add that 1K resistor. Make sure it's 1K. We'll move those labels, just shift clicking those or control clicking those uh, text labels individually to move them. I type the pin one. Pins two and four are both tied to ground. Let's grab a ground. Pins one and three now also need to connect to uh, some resonating capacitors. And these need to be 22 picofarads. These capacitors are connected to ground on the other side. And then pins three and pins one through that one, one K current limiting resistor connect to X in and X out respectively. So let's make a label for X in and one for X out. Copy those from control clicking to select multiple the control C to copy control V to paste. Right click, mirror horizontally, and connect those up to the RP2040. The QSPICE pins, there are six pins here, and there are six pins here, and they are one for one. Um, select data zero, data one, data two, data three, clock. Select clock, data zero, data one, data two, data three, or IO zero. Yeah. And then VCC goes to 3.3 volts, and there's ground, and this also needs a one microfarad or 100 nanofarad, depending on who you ask, uh, decoupling capacitor. We're going to use the one microfarad decoupling capacitor on VCC. I'll grab a 3.3 volt power rail. And then I'm going to quickly make labels for the six pins, connect to those six pins up there. Okay, so I've made these six labels up here. Control C, Control V. I'm going to select them, copy and paste. And then we can move them into position and move that clock up here. So the select goes to select, clock to clock, zero to zero, one to one. And the same here, select to select, zero to zero, one to one, clock to clock. All right. The last thing to do is connect this last switch up to the Q select pin. We'll copy this Q select uh, net up to the second switch. And this will be pulling the Q select pin to ground through a 1K resistor. It's a current limiting resistor, so let's grab this 1K resistor. It 
And so this is a boot select pin. Um, when this switch is held, it selects which system the RP2040 boots into. When the Q select line is pulled to ground, the RP2040 boots into the bootloader. And when it's left loading or is pulled up to 3.3 volts, it is going into uh, the user code that's stored on the flash memory. For this reason, uh, we can also add two 5.1K resistors in series, which is equivalent to a 10K resistor, to the QSelect pin and pull that up to 3.3 volts. I'm using a two 5.1K resistors in series instead of the 10K resistor because it's cheaper that way, actually. Um, the more parts, the more like, unique parts you have in your bill of materials, the higher the cost of the PCB is, um, especially at scale. And so by taking out the need for 10K resistors and just using 5.1K resistors, um, you're reducing the, the bomb cost simply by having less lines in your bomb, right? That's nice and readable. All right, so those are our two lines for boot select and reset. So with this, that's everything we need for the RB2040 to run. And the only thing left to add now are everything we're going to connect to our GPIOs. So it's probably gonna be the switch matrix and uh, maybe a few other things. So let's go over what we have so far. We have a USB-C port with 5.1K resistors to ground on the CC pins and a fuse from the VBUS to create a stable five volts. This five volts is also fed from our JST connector, which goes into a decoupling capacitor and through our 3.5 or 3.3 volt regulator and through another decoupling capacitor to give us a stable 3.3 volts. Uh, our D plus and D minus pins from the USB connection on the computer go through this SRVO 5-4 which um, protects against ESD spikes. A reset switch uh, ties the reset net to ground and is pulled up through a 5.1K resistor. And the uh, boot select switch is also tied to ground through a 1K series resistor and uh, an equivalent 10-ish K pull-up resistor. We have a debug header, which has our reset 3.3 volt ground and SWC and SWD pins on it. We have decoupling capacitors for the internal 1.1 volt regulator, the, uh, the 1.1 volt reference, a bulk 3.3 volt cap, and the other three 3.3 volt pins on the RP2040. We have terminating resistors on the USB lines going into the RP2040. We have a decoupling capacitor on our flash chip, which is hooked up directly to the RP2040, and our crystal has uh, 22 picavarad resonance capacitors on pins one and three, and then pins two and four go to ground, and then one of the outputs goes through a 1.1K resistor to the X in and X out on the RP2040. When making connections that cross over each other like this, so this capacitor is connected to pin one, and this ground connected to pin two, these wires cross but the wires are not connected. So if instead you saw a green dot here, there would be a connection, and that's a short that you do not want. So we're going to route this wire, and, and don't click on this, go past it and click on the node you want to connect to, so there is no connection between crossing lines. That's also another reason why we use these labels. So there are no crossing lines or we're minimizing crossing lines in the wires of our schematic. So let's go back to our KLE and see what we need to do here to make the keyboard matrix. In the summary tab in KLE, it tells us there's 103 switches. So we will need 103 switch symbols in our schematic to correspond to all of these alternate layouts for this TKL. We'll be using the Marbast lib libraries for hot swap sockets. So let's add with the A key an MX hot swap. MX switch hot swap from Marbaslib. And we can use the PCM version of this library, the, the content management. This is a version I have installed locally. This is the one we installed earlier in the video. So let's use this one from the, from the PCM, the content manager. 
So on a standard TKL, there are 18 columns of keys and six rows of keys. So let's go ahead and make those. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then that's 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. I'm going to make a grid of 18 by 6 of these keys, but first I'm going to add a diode to the switch. So let's add a D small and rotate that diode so it's pointing downwards. That's our column to row direction. And then we can make a grid of 18 by 6 of these. One moment. So I'm just using copy paste here to add more switches to this row. So we're at 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Just need three more. 16, 17, 18. And I'm also placing these directly on the grid crosshairs. So that's four, five, six rows of, of switches. And that's 18 by six and get my calculator out. 18 by six is 108 switches and we need 103. So we have five more than we need, but that's okay. I'm gonna go through and delete the ones we don't need and add some more to places we do. So in this top row, for example, we only need you know, the 12 function keys and then the four other keys. So that's only 16 switches. So we need to delete two of them from this row. I want to delete this one here because that's like the escape to F1 gap. And then I'm gonna go down to um, probably the end of F8, which is this one, and delete this here. So we have F9, 10, 11, 12, and then pause home and scroll lock or whatever that is. I'm also going to move this away just a little bit so we can visually see that this is the nav cluster area. And if we can move the function row up just a bit as well, we can see, okay, that's a function row and that's a nav cluster. I wanna go through and also add some alternate layouts. So here we need to copy this switch and diode for the stepped caps lock key, for example. And we also want to move that kind of a way so we can see that it's for the stepped caps lock. And then likewise, we're going to have a few extra switches for, say, split backspace and for the split shift keys and for the Sangan layout. And we're going to delete the extra switches we don't need from like the bottom row. We need a few switches, right? Not all 18 of them. And we don't need this whole cluster on, on top of the arrows, right? So I'm going to go through and create 103 switches that roughly matches our keyboard layout, but still sticks to... The, the grid that we've set up here. Okay, so we have the 103 switches and their corresponding diodes all laid out in the correct layout. So we have our main 60% uh, cluster, uh, a function row, the three keys here, nav cluster, arrow keys, split backspace, um, ISO enter, that other key you get with ISO, split right shift, split left shift, uh, step caps and the Sangan layout with three and then the seven space bar on the, on the inside. Oh, this is kind of overlapping our capacitors here. So I want to move our decoupling capacitors out of the way of the matrix. That way we can also move the matrix out of the way of everything else and within the footprint of the rest of the, the page here. I'm going to move the reset switch in just a bit, kind of tidy things up. Get things tucked out of the way. So we have plenty of room to work with our matrix. That looks really good. So you can typically just move components of your PCB around wherever you feel like uh, works. Uh, just keep in mind there's also a logical flow to it all too, right? So we don't want to just move things willy-nilly and have uh, our flash tip all the way over here. You want to keep things kind of close to where they're supposed to be. So I think this gives us a good amount of space to work with our matrix while also clearing up uh, some of the edges so we can kind of a, a visual centering of everything. So let's try to place these uh, components. Now we'll see that it doesn't start with switch one, it starts with switch three, uh, distant deletions and additions, right? Um, and then there's also around here switch one and switch two, but those aren't MX switches. So I like to rename these actually to be 
So this would be the reset switch RST. RST1, sure. And this is our boot select switch. So we can call this boot1. And now we can free up the SW um, label for just the MX switches. I like to also fill in the schematic symbol reference designators. Even though they're already filled, I want to sort them by the Y position, like we're reading a book left to right. And we want to um, reset all of the existing annotations. And we'll do the entire sheet. So let's go ahead and annotate those. And now we'll see that switch one, the escape, actually is switch one, the escape key. And switch 103 is this bottom rightmost switch 103 key. So we'll notice that this layout of keys, uh, when we're reading it left to right, exactly matches the left to right reading of our KLE. The next, step to, the next step is to assign footprints to all of these parts. We can run the footprint assignment tool and we'll see that some of them already have footprints and some of them don't. So a lot of our diodes don't, our capacitors don't, right? But our hot stop sockets do and some of them may not be the right size. So our XC6206 already has a package. We can right click that and view the footprint and it's a standard SOT23 footprint. This is only a few millimeters large, right? SRV05 has a footprint coming from the Marbaslib library, RB2040, and the W25Q has uh, packages that are preloaded. So we just need like the crystal and the diodes and the capacitors. So for the diodes, the most common footprint we're going to be using is in this library called Diode SMD, and it's going to be the SOD123. So we can select all of our diodes, hold shit, hold control, or sorry, hold shift and click all the diodes at once. We shift click all of those. We can assign them diode uh, SOD123 with a double click. All of our capacitors, we can control click all of those. We'll be using 0402 for pretty much all of them. So let's go to capacitor SMD and find the 0402-1005 metric. So this is one by one half millimeters um, in size. The 10U bulk capacitor, we're gonna use an 0603 part. That looks right, so all of these are 0402, and then the 10U is 0603. <clears throat> the Fuse will use a uh, Fuse SMD, should be in here, Fuse, and we'll grab an uh, 0206. One by four connector is a JST connector. You can also use an easy mate connector, but for this video, we'll be using JST SH. So we'll go to connector JST and we'll find a four pin SH horizontal connector. So that's the SH04, uh, SH SM04B. If you view this footprint, uh, it's a horizontal four pin connector um, with one millimeter pin spacing. Our five pin connector is our debug. Uh, I like to use a standard uh, 2.5 millimeter pin header for this. So we'll just use a pin header vertical and we'll make sure it's by five pins. So if we view that footprint, it just gives us five points to solder to or to connect wires to or little debug pins in a little row. Our resistors, we will all be using here uh, the 0402 footprint. So let's go to resistor SMD. And find the R's, there we go, resistor SMD. Find our 0402. Our USB 2.0 connector, USB-C connector, we'll go to connector USB-C, or connector USB, 
and find the HRO. So it's USB-C receptacle HRO type C3112. It's a very common uh, uh, USB-C receptacle footprint. It's surface mount, um, and they're pretty ubiquitous and cheap. The last things are our uh, SW push and at the bottom here are crystal. So let's go to JLC parts and try to find a crystal and push button that we like. So if we search for um, basic parts, that'd be ideal, right? So let's find a 12 megahertz crystal. So what we have here is the only basic part that has a 12 megahertz crystal. Um, and it's the X3, the X3225-12. So that's 3.2 by 2.5 millimeters at 12 megahertz. That's how that part number breaks down. And what we see is it's an SMD3225. So we'll be using this part when we order our PCBs. Go back to KiCad and find a 3225 crystal. Here's the crystal library, and it's SMD3225. Here we are. So that's what we need for our crystal. You can also check the footprint here. Um, if we inspect like the width and height of this footprint, it's like five by 4.1 uh, millimeters from the corner to corner of these pads. And if you look at the data sheet of this crystal, there will be a, uh, a footprint layout. And if we add all of these together, uh, 1.4 plus 0.8 plus 1.4, that's 3.6. And 1.8 2 plus 0 0.5 plus 1.2 is 2.9. Um, it's actually quite smaller than what we have here. Interesting. Oh, this is the hand soldering version. So this gives you extra room around the pieces to hand solder. So if we look at the non-hand soldering version, then yes, this is that 3.6 by 2.9 that we calculated earlier, which falls directly in line with what, what is suggested from the data sheet. So that's perfect. We'll select this non-hand soldered version, this one. Now we also need a push switch. It can really be any switch. It can be an MX switch. It can be a a chalk switch, but let's search in our basic parts for a momentary switch. And we'll see what comes up. Oh, nothing comes up. All right, what about switch? Okay. Let's see. In the key and switch section, we'll go back to the JLC PCB parts. And we'll find a push switch. Uh, there seems to be quite a few of them here. And we'll just find, if there's any in the basic parts, there's not. But we'll just find the, the cheapest one, right? Uh, price, low to high. Ooh, these sortings aren't very good. Let's look for S. P S T. No? Okay. Uh, momentary. Oh, nothing. Interesting. Now, there's usually some kind of switches in here. So I was looking in the wrong spot. We're looking in the uh, all components, right? We're going down to keys, switches, and we'll find the tactile switches here. And there is a basic part, which is this TS1187A. 
and it uses, if we look at the data sheet here, this seven by four and a half millimeter uh, footprint. So we can try to find a seven by four and a half millimeter footprint for this switch. You could use any switch you'd want to find, but this one is a basic part and is dirt cheap, one and a half cents each. So let's look through switches. Button switch SMD. And we're not looking for dip switches, we're looking for push switches. And I think it's one of these, these footprints, something like this. Let me find it real quick. All right, so we're looking for a switch footprint that has this octagonal shape, and then the pads have an internal spacing of three by five, and outside spacing of uh, four and a half by seven. So we have this uh, TL3342, has that octagonal shape. And then when we measure, the internal spacing is 4.6 by 2.8, which is smaller than that 3.5. And the outside spacing is larger than the four and a half by seven. So we have nice big landing pads for this switch to go and it'll be easy for the switch to be soldered to those pads. So we'll select that switch footprint for our push button switches. And now all of our parts have footprints. All the symbols have footprints tied to them. And we're ready to um, move on to placing parts in the PCB. So if we go to PCB in board editor, We can open a new PCB. And we're just going to go ahead and save this. I haven't saved in a while, so it's Control S to save. And then we can import, uh, update the PCB with changes made to schematic. And that will add all of our footprints um, to the PCB. And we can see that all of the pads are red, but we want all of these pads to be on the back, which is the blue layer and this blue copper. So we'll hit F to flip. Now we will be using this KLE placer uh, plugin and that needs the KLE JSON file. And it also needs the uh, diodes and switches, or at least the first switch and diode to be placed. So let's find switch one and diode one and place those. So if we go to our schematic, we'll find switch one. Should be our escape key. Hit M to move and place it in the top left corner. And then we'll find diode one by selecting it in the schematic, tabbing over to our PCB and hitting M to move. And we can place this diode with respect to the switch however we want to. I like to put them uh, right up. I know the red looks like there's going to be an error, but I promise you uh, there's not going to be an error. I like to put them right below uh, the switch uh, midline between the small and large uh, holes. Now, we will, I will note that my grid is exactly this many millimeters. That's 19.05 millimeters divided by, I think, 24 or yeah, 19.05 divided by 24, yes. So that gives me um, enough granularity to route, uh, to route wires while still being coarse enough to place components. So now that the first diode and switch are placed, we can go to our KLE, go to the raw data, and download the JSON. I have this keyboard layout 5.json in my downloads folder. If we go back to our PCB and we load up the KLE Placer plugin, we can select this JSON and 
we notice that our keys are all SW and our diodes all start with D. And then we are going to move our diodes as well as our switches and move the diodes based on this first diode switch pair and hit OK. So that automatically placed all of the diodes and switches for our keys, including like the ISO enter key, which uh, if we go back to our, our schematic is, is this key here. And we notice that every key here lines up exactly with the switches in our schematic, which lines up exactly with the layout in our KLE, which is exactly what we wanted to see, right? So like the bottom arrow key, if I select that here, if we alt tab to our schematic, it, that's the bottom arrow key. And yeah, that, that's definitely where it is in the PCB. And we can double check, especially around the extra keys, make sure things are in the right space. Okay, so that's a really quick way to place our switches. Now there are also the components here that aren't switches and diodes and they kind of got put in the middle of everything. So if we control Z to undo the hat, um, we can actually just move everything out of the way, like really far out of the way. And then we can run this KLE placer again. Grab that JSON. Okay, so now we have our components and they're not in the way of the rest of our switches. Now, because these switches and diodes um, are not like the right size, we can change their footprint sizes back in the, uh, the schematic. And that's quite a process, but it's, it's okay. Uh, we'll get through it real quick. If we go to our footprint assignment tool, and we can select which switches need to be what size. So I'm gonna do a little left, right uh, screen action here. Okay, and we're going to open the marbaslib library, the marbaslib mx, the PCM marbaslib mx, and make sure we're looking at these mx switches with the uh, hot swap symbols at the very bottom here, right? And going through each switch, we're going to determine if its size needs to be changed. So this will be the escape key and the F key, F rows. Those are all one U. This is your tilde. And in fact, we might just do a bit of this. There we go. Kind of have everything all on the screen at once. Wow. Okay. We can go through the switches and see which key is which. And that's escape, those are our function keys. That's your tilde, one, two, and there's your backspace key. So switch 30 is backspace. That's a two U key, but in Marbaslib, the two U's are all stabs. So anything above 1.75 U is just a one U switch. So we'll keep going, switch 34, 35, there's our split backspace. This is our tab key, switch 36. That needs to be 1.5 units in the hot swap. Okay, it's QWERTY. All right, our last switch here is our um, pipe key. That needs to be 1.5 units. And then this is our ISO enter key. And that's also just one unit because we'll have the stabilizers later. Uh, this is stepped caps lock. And so that'll be 1.75 U step. And it'll be step 1.25, which is the standard caps lock stepping distance. And so this is a regular caps lock. That's just a 1.75 U key. There's ASDF. We'll go through, so that's the enter key, and that's the spare ISO key up here. So that's, those are both one U keys. This is our left split shift. I'm gonna want that to be a 1.25 U key. This is our um, split shift, the, the right half of the left split shift, that's a one U. And then the shift is just a one U as well. We'll add the stabilizers later. 
And then the next non one U key would be our right split shift. And that would be this key here, which is key 84. So the switch 84 will be 1.75 units. Our next keys to uh, embiggen are the lower modifiers. These would be 1.25, and then these four will be 1.5. So this is 1.25, 1.25, 1.25. 5. This is the space bar, stays at one. And these four are 1.25. And then we have the arrow keys, one, two, three, and then these three modifiers, that's 1.5U, 1.5U, spacebar, 1.5U, 1.5U. So that should be all of our key sizes. When we save the schematic, we can then update the PCB, and that should fill out the sizing of all of our switches. So now we have like our 1.5 U and 1.75 U keys here and this 1.25 U key, which is flipped um, or, or stepped caps locks. It has the correct uh, bounding box. So the next thing to add to our PCB are the stabilizers for the shifts, enter, backspace, and the two space bars. So back in the schematic, we will add with a key, a stab. And that'll be from the PCM Marbas Lib MX. And we need one for left shift. We need one for each space bar. We need one for right shift, enter, and backspace, which uh, I'll just put it over here as well. And we can edit each one of these directly to choose the footprint. So left shift needs a 2.25U stabilizer. This space bar needs to be 6.25U, it is. This one needs to be seven units. This one needs to be 2.75U. This one, 2.25 for the enter key. This one for the backspace. Let's go ahead and move this over one spot in the grid. Backspace will be 2U. And we also need the ISO enter. So let's make one more. And that'll be ISO. So stab MX ISO. And that looks, that looks best. So we'll save that. And then we can, we could use the KLE placer plugin, but for these, I think it's a good practice to place these by hand. We'll update the PCB. That'll add our stabilizers. Then we can move our spacebar stabilizer in place, center it on the switch. And because it's a spacebar, we'll go ahead and rotate that at 180 degrees. And same for the 6.25. Our 2.75 on the shift key, uh, the enter key, left shift. ISO enter and backspace. Now, unfortunately, because this is a hot swap board, we will not be putting the ISO enters in place, but for the rest of them, we will be uh, placing the, uh, the split components, the, the, the multiple layouts on the PCB. Um, we also are going to be trimming down how many diodes we're using. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, just for the sake of, of not wanting to collide hot swap sockets with too many things, go ahead and delete 
that uh, ISO enter and the corresponding ISO key and the ISO stab from the PCB. If we update that, those keys, oh, and we delete the footprints and other symbols, those keys get deleted. When we go to combine these multiple layouts, and we move these footprints, we'll see these hotspot sockets are interfering with each other. The easiest way to deal with this is to rotate one of the sockets so that none of these uh, silk screen lines overlap with any of the holes. This will also mean that some diodes need to be moved. And while this switch has its own diode, uh, because you can't install both of these switches at the same time, we don't need that diode. So we can go back to the PCB, delete the diode, save it, and then update the PCB again with the delete footprints with no symbols flag checked. We can do the same for these split spacebar layouts. We can go ahead and delete this diode D71. And then we can move these switches into here, but we can rotate them by 180 degrees. Move all of these with the M key. And then update the PCB to delete that diode D71. And then move these diodes. You can long press the left mouse button to select which one you want to click. Hit M to move and move these diodes again kind of out of the footprint of the switches because they are kind of in the way. All right. So that's uh, caps locks and split left shift. Um, it looks like these blue corners are overlapping um, the holes, but in reality, this will not be an issue, and the hot swap socket will not overlap the hole. There is um, a bit of a buffer on the pad here on the PCB, on the footprint, where the socket has room to be soldered, but it the physical part of the socket doesn't extend past the hole itself. So this is okay. Same applies for these stab holes. For screw-in stabilizers, there's a clip that comes out through the bottom of the PCB. And the clip is only on like the bottom quarter, or in the case of a space bar, the top quarter of the circle. So the hot stop socket overlapping that hole is not going to be an issue. So let's do the same for split backspace. We don't need this diode, diode D30, so we can delete that. And we needed those diodes before so that the um, placer plugin script would work correctly. And we can update the schematic, or update the PCB from the schematic. We can move the switches into place. And always grab them by the center hole. That's where the grid lines up. And we can rotate those switches in place. moving the diodes out of the way. Let's do split right shift, exact same things, and then we'll work on the Zangan bottom row layout. So we don't need this center diode. And the reason we don't need this diode is because we're going to be sharing the same matrix location with probably the larger of the shift keys. You can move these shift keys into position. Now here, it's the same deal with the left shift, where it looks like these blue pads are cutting into the circle, but it will not be an issue when it comes to actually producing the PCB. Now the final thing to add as far as multiple layout goes is this bottom row. Um, from experience, we're just going to flip these four on the bottom and then the rightmost three switches on the ANSI layout. And we're also going to delete the diodes from all of the Sangen layout uh, row. So let's go to the Sangen layout row. 
delete all seven of these diodes because this switch will share the same matrix position as that one and vice versa. I'll take the PCB here. I think uh, KiCad just crashed on me. So let's see if the autosave worked. It didn't. Okay, one moment while I update everything. Okay, I've got everything back from the crash. Um, we're going to rotate these four switches and these right three as well. And then we're going to take this whole row and merge it up to the top. Now, sometimes it wants to snap to like random things. You can usually coax it to snap to the grid itself. We'll take the diodes and move them out to the side between the switches. This one looks fine here. This one's fine here. And then these diodes need to be moved out to the side. All right. So now every switch location has a hot swap socket. And then every electrical matrix location has a diode with some switches sharing the same electrical location. So like these two switches here will share this diode and this one will have this diode. Um, so that's all of our switches placed. Um, and now it's time to place the controller, RP2040, the flash, a USB port, DSD connector, and all of our passives. I like to place the RP2040 in the spacebar or kind of you know close to the spacebar area. It gives us lots of room to route around it. And the only place we need to worry about is kind of like the screws here. And so there's plenty of room. I like to kind of zoom in and see our 3.3 volt corner, which is three pins that both that all say 3.3 volts. That's going to be um, not pin one. This is pin one over here. But this will be uh, kind of my reference for seeing this is where the USB uh, data pins come in are these two blue pins. And it's also where the 1.1 volt regulator output is here. So that'll be kind of an important corner for lots of capacitors and passives. And near pin one is the QSPY connections. So I'm keeping track of those QSPY connections, those six lines as well. I think this is a good place to stop since we have everything in the schematic and PCB done, um, or everything in the schematic done and all of the parts on the PCB and all of the switches placed correctly, we'll go through placing and routing the RP2040 and um, the rest of the components in the next video.